Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number 36 of Nostalgia Talk. I'm James, and something a lot of you regular listeners are aware of is that in the intros of these shows, I always like to give past guests little birthday shout outs, and that's exactly what I'm going to do today. Uh, today, August the 19th, marks the birthday of two past guests, actually. Uh, a Sesame Street legend, composer, and writer, Chris Cerf, who is best known for many, many great Sesame Street songs. And another past guest whose birthday is today is Ricky Boyd, a puppeteer who has worked with the Muppets on many occasions and an animator uh, for Magnetic Dreams. So happy birthday to Chris and Ricky. And this Saturday, August the 21st, marks another past guest birthday, Lou Berger. Lou is, Ses should I say was, Sesame Street's head writer when I was in single digits and also one of my writing idols and somebody I'm still very close with. So Chris, Ricky, and Lou, happy birthday. And now on with the show. We have another guest here who's another friend, a fellow Nova Scotian, Terry Angus. How you doing, Terry? Hello, I'm doing fine. How you doing? I'm not bad. Very hot. I was not expecting this heat today. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I've been indoors, so I've had like fans going and everything here, so uh, I seem yeah. to be okay there. <laughs> I, I got a fan in... Uh, in this in this room and in the rental house that I work at, it's it's nice and air conditioned, which right. is which is nice. Uh, like when you walk in, and it was a little raining in the morning, and then it gets to this. I thought it was going to be raining all day. <laughs> I don't know. I guess not. Mm -hmm. so it's been sunny out here and there anyway. Nice. Now Terry, for anyone who doesn't know, first of all, I should say this: that Terry is a fellow Nova Scotian. I am in the suburbs of Halifax, in a place called Fall River. And where are you at right now? Well, I'm in Halifax right now. No, I'm I'm in Halifax. I uh, I was born in uh, 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 an Amherst way there, and oh, nice. uh, I lived around Ang Amherst Pugwash. I went to Pugwash High School there. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, so fellow Nova Scotian, and I've lived here in Halifax for quite some time. Mm, that makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> now, for anyone who doesn't know uh, who Terry is, he is a puppeteer who has done work with the Muppets and Jim Henson. He was in Fraggle Rock doing various characters, Storyteller Fraggle, uh, just to name one of, the, one of the few regulars. He was in Follow That Bird. Um, I almost said Adventures of Elmo and Grouchland, but no, uh, Muppet Family Christmas. I don't know how I got stuck yep. on that. Yeah, you're doing good. You're doing good. Muppet yep. Family Christmas. Yep. yep. And he also was the uh, creator and a performer on the show Blizzard Island. Yeah, co-creator of Blizzard Island. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Correct. And also Correct. created his own puppet character for his own online series, Butch Cat. Butch G Cat. Yep. Right. Yep. What does the G stand for? It could stand for anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a fancy thing. It, it, it just sounded good. I, 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 I hereby christen him Butch Jeffrey Cat. <laughs> Butch Jeffrey Cat, eh? Uh, well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks. You regular listeners can leave a comment if you understand the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air reference. Anyway, so let's get on with the show. <laughs> oh, oh. Okay, the, the, that went over. Yeah, I, I not watched. <laughs> Prince of Bel Air. No, <laughs> love that show. <laughs> so let's begin uh, with um, "Once Upon a Time" years ago. What got you interested in puppetry? Uh, you know, I'm not even really that sure what got me interested too much. Um, mm, um, somehow, I like. Uh, uh, I, I uh, oh boy, I was doing impersonations and stuff. I guess in high school, and I used to impersonate some of the high school teachers and uh, uh yeah, well, yeah a couple of them there they're they were very good easy to uh, impersonate <laughs> and um they must have loved uh, you yeah. <laughs> i did the principal there errol whalen at the time oh my he, god uh, uh, you know he was a, yeah yeah he was and, and this was at and this was at pugwash district high right yes correct yeah because correct. i remember you had told me before that you went there yeah yeah, and uh, yeah, so I did a lot of uh, impersonation. Uh, um, um, I uh, like uh, Don Adams from Get Smart. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. What you believe? What you believe? Well, Siegfried, that's just the end of your little kidnapping operation. So, yeah, yeah. You do it well. You do it very well. 
Thank you. Yeah, on, on that note, I actually should mention to uh, all the listeners out there, Terry and I have actually met quite a few times. I mean, being in Nova Scotia, that's quite likely. The first time was actually kind of funny. Um, there was, uh, we have an art gallery here in a, in a city called Dartmouth. It's called the Dart Gallery. And Yeah, uh, I remember that one. Yeah. And there was a Jim Henson exhibition, like a tribute exhibition there that had paintings of Muppets and all that. And my family knew about it, and we were like, let's go after it's open so that way it's not too much of a rush and then i get this email from a buddy of mine and he's like i just saw somebody on the news that had fozzy on his hand his thing was something angus and he's gonna be at the opening of the jim henson exhibition i'm thinking to myself i know exactly who you're talking about so <laughs> <laughs> well, so great. i talked my family into us going and my family got to the dark gallery and then i and like i recognize all of these muppet performers like i know what these people look like and Sure enough, Terry walks into the dark gallery and I look at my mom and I was like, mom, that's him. That's Terry Angus. He was the storyteller Fraggle on Fraggle Rock. <laughs> <laughs> so he talked a little bit about how he became involved with the Muppets and Henson and all that. And you're probably going to hear some of those stories uh, here today. Um, and afterwards, I went, I went up to him and I was like, are you Terry Angus? You were on Fraggle Rock. And he's like, Yes, I was. And I said, yeah, um, I'm a big fan of Muppets, Sesame Street, Fraggle Rock. And uh, by any chance, would you be willing to sign my Fraggle Rock DVD? And sure enough, he did. And I still have it. Oh, my. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> what well, most of you people may not know, or some of you may not know, is that we actually are seeing each other. So what he's showing me is uh, a yeah. uh, uh, signature that I did for him. And it says to James from the storyteller Fraggle and Terry Angus. And, yeah. and so that was the first time I ever met a Muppet performer. And now obviously through this show, I've gotten to meet quite a few Marty Robinson, yes. Noel McNeil, Cheryl Blaylock, oh, Marty Robertson. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Gord Robertson, Tim Gosley. Oh, Tim and Gord. Oh my Lord. Oh, and actually oh. the, the first guest I had on here was Mike Peterson. Mike Peters. Yes, yeah, well, I know Mike very well. Yes, I, yes. I took a course with Mike not too long after I met you, and he's, oh my God, he's one of the best teachers I've ever had, really. <laughs> he really is. He's I've a learned. good guy. He's a good uh, guy. They're all great guys. They, oh, they yeah. Great, great people. You know? Absolutely. And so, yeah, Terry and I have occasionally run into each other. I remember one time, it was actually at my school. I think I had just finished up an assignment or something, and I'm just kind of waiting for my ride, so because I can't drive i know that makes me sound like a loser i'm 22 years old not able to drive <laughs> <laughs> but um i remember i was just walking around going to get something i think and i see terry and i was like hey and then we i think he was going to an interview or something with, for one of the courses at my school and so he comes out of it and my buddy bryce and i are sitting on the couch outside of the room Terry comes out and I said, Bryce, this is Terry. Terry worked with Jim Henson on Fraggle Rock. And Terry's telling us all these stories about Fraggle Rock, Muppet Family, Christmas, follow that bird. And then as soon as Terry leaves, Bryce is dying laughing. Like he's on the floor laughing. <laughs> <laughs> was it that bad or was he just amused by some other thing? <laughs> <laughs> he was a, one Muppet nerd and one Muppet performer. The worlds connect, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I I looked at him and I was like, you probably were not expecting that to happen today. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's good. That's good. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Ha uh, ha. Yes. Hey, Fozzie. My wife loves children, but I can't bear them. Ah. <laughs> uh. Um. During that, in high school, I did variety concerts. I would go up and do the stand-up, you know, impersonations. It's sort of like a stand-up comedy type of comedian type of thing. And um, somehow the puppets came into play somewhere around there. Um, and um, I think uh, I felt uh, more at ease with having the puppets on stage and uh, kind of thing uh, than myself. It's easier just to not be seen and just have the puppet in the in the in in the on the stage or whatever kind of thing. so it started off that way and i like the muppet show the most uh, although i you know I, I remember muppets since i was a kid you know watching sesame street kind of thing and then the muppet show comes along and that was you know that's really funny i mean that muppet show was, was you know 
Uh, of course, when they started on Sesame Street years ago, the humor was such that adults could enjoy it and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it was written, well, they wrote it for themselves and nobody else, really, just to amuse themselves. And, um, uh, and of course, later on, you know, and then they got in with the Muppet Show. But the humor of the Muppet Show is really, and, and, and the, how much de detail and, 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 and they, they just did such a great job with that show. Uh, and, and the writing on it's just uh, great, you know, with Jerry Jewell head writing it, how could you lose, you know, kind of thing. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so there we go. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's the sort of how I got into that. And it just got much easier. And I started uh, and, and, and like, like most, uh, most of, of the fans out there that love to have a Kermit the Frog and all that stuff. My Kermit the Frog for the first time was one of those Fisher Price Kermit the Frog kind of thing, you know, the, the doll kind of thing with the uh, Velcro on the wrist kind of thing. And um, uh, so it was like a doll, but I, I sort of cut the bottom and pulled out some of the stuff and was able to get my hand up into the head. I would pull some of the stuffing up so I could do that. And then I would find an actual Fisher Price Kermit the Frog hand puppet kind of thing. And those are kind of small, of course, nowadays, but um, I use those to get started. And um, I, um, I, I had a Frog Prince record. Kind of thing. Now, uh, the Frog Prince was something that Henson did years ago at the CBC in the early mid 70s, somewhere around there, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even the 60s, um, the Frog Prince. Uh, I, think, I think you're right, 70s. Pardon? I, th I think the 70s is correct. Yes, yeah, I think so. And uh, uh, so that they, they made a record of that, as well as they made a record originally of uh, Muppets Musicians of Bremen and that kind of thing. But uh, it was the Frog Prince that I used. And I would play back uh, Jim in the opening of the thing. Hi ho, Kermit the Frog here. And I would stop the record and I would repeat, Hi ho, Kermit the Frog here. <laughs> and uh, I would do, Today's a real fan, fantastic story. It's all about frogs. And what could be better? The hero's a frog, and I'm a frog, and there are bunches and bunches of other frogs, but don't get me wrong. So, you know, the, so I learned how to uh, impersonate the voice that way, or try to impersonate the voice. Kind of thing. And Kermit is the hardest of the voices that I tried to learn. That one kind of took me about a year before I got it even close oh. to what, you know, what, it, what I could get it, you know, kind of or at least I think it was anyway. Um, but uh, then there was everybody else, like Fozzie Bear, you know, hey, hey, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Ralph the dog, you know, Ralph the dog, play the piano, and, you know, sing, sing wonderful things, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, play Cog Trump, Captains of Pigs in Space. <laughs> you know, Sweetie Chef. <laughs> Get a skitter, yay board here, day third, board, board, board. Yeah, right. So mostly, yeah, you were, so, mostly so mostly you were just impersonating Jim's characters. Well, that and others too. I'm just trying to, they're just the ones that are like appearing in my head right now. Kind okay. Of thing. But yeah, you know, the scooter is, is, is kind of, is, is, I think it's an easy voice. I don't know if I, I've, I've mastered it or not, but, uh, well, um, Hey, Chief, it's really great to be here. But like disguising their car so they won't be recognized. You know, that kind of thing. Um, you even uh, do the hand thing very well, like the thing that Scooter does with his fist. Well, yeah, that was a Rich, Richard Hunt. I, I don't know wh why he did that, but he, <laughs> <laughs> he did that a lot with the character. Uh, you oh, know, yeah. The, the fist going like that. They won't be recognized, you know, kind of thing. Uh <laughs> Uh, Gonzo's harder for me to do today than it was then. Um, uh, Gonzo's, uh, <clears throat> hey, Kermit, this is a great chicken act. You're gonna really gonna love this act. Really hard on the throat to do Gonzo. Oh yeah. It's really, it's quite of a, a vibrating uh, down there. Uh, so Gonzo's, these days for me, Gonzo's harder, but I could really whip Gonzo like no problem way back then. You know, kind of thing. Uh, but and, you know, as we grow older, our vocals, Get older too so mm -hmm. you know your voice is going to somewhat get deeper as you get older kind of mm. thing. So, yeah. um, 
Who else is there that is? Um, Cookie Monster. Yep. Yep. There's Cookie Monster. Me, me love them cookies. Yep. Nom, 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 nom. Me, me do more Frank Oz cookie. No, because <laughs> Frank Oz cookies a li little bit different than what cookie is right now. Yeah, I, I remember uh, you were uh, uh, talking to uh, Bryce and I about uh, about doing cookie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. And then there's, hello there, this is your old pal Grover. Yes, and I am you too. <laughs> Uh, let's see who else is there. It's like a regular yeah, I'm to, blank here. Yeah, I'm trying to think of everybody I can, and and it's amazing how much your blank, your mind goes blank on on what you're trying to remember. Who, who else is there? You know, kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Floyd Pepper. No, I don't do him too well, but <laughs> anyway, not bad. <laughs> not too bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So from doing impressions and um you know, learning how to do puppets and all of that. How did you eventually get involved with the Muppets? Well, um, I was in, when I was in high school, I was in grade 12 when, when this all came down. And um, I was reading in the Halifax Herald, which we got from Pug Wash, um, that uh, I read, read in the paper that uh, Jim Henson was doing a, a TV series in Toronto and uh, I saw that and I thought, <gasps> you know, kind of thing. Oh, gosh, I got to get I got to get to see that. I got to get to that audition or whatever. But um, I don't know. That's, uh, I'm just dreaming. I'm just dreaming. So I took the paper into my guidance counselor and I said, what is the odds of uh, getting involved with this? And I'm having handed him the, um, the paper. And he looked at me and said, uh, uh, all they can say is no. Kind of thing. And I said, oh, great. So, but now. The next thing was, how the heck do I get to Toronto? I'm still living with my parents and everything. So um, uh, during the weekend, or, or a little bit before that, while, while I went to the guidance counselor about this, a couple of other teachers got together and were trying to find out more about the audition. And uh, they, they called around and everything. And I think it was uh, Tom and Joe Webb, uh, which are two teachers in, in Pugwash, uh, Tom and Joe Webb, and they found the contact in the CBC to, uh, they, made, they made the contact. While others, uh, like um, uh, my guidance counselor, Gene Wallace, and his, his wife uh, were able to get people together to get the money together for me to fly into Toronto for the audition. So all that went on, and Flew into uh, Toronto, had a harrowing taxi drive there. <laughs> so the traffic was, was was crazy. I wasn't used to it because I can't, you know, I've never seen traffic like that you know, in Toronto. And um, so I drove to the audition. Now the first audition uh, sort of took place on a Monday, and this it all happened very fast because like it's like the weekend, and then all of a sudden I'm going and and all that stuff on a Monday. And Richard Hunt was doing the first set of auditions, famous for Scooter, uh, Janice, uh, um, Beaker, uh, uh, a lot of those guys. Um, mm -hmm. Don and, Music, uh, Forgetful Jones, Sully, Gladys the Cow, Sonny that's Friendly. Right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so, you know, the audition there and waiting with people there. And like, we're, my mother came with me. Uh, for the first part of this trip and uh, we were sitting there waiting to be called into the audition and people were coming out of the audition frazzled and kind of you know uh not knowing what it was like you know it's it just a shock to them it was like crazy in there one one girl came out that the guy's crazy the guy's crazy and she just you know went on there my mother turned to me and said if they want crazy, you give them crazy. Kind of <laughs> so, okay. So I went in there and, and Richard was very, uh, he, was, he was like a drill sergeant. Okay, all right, I want you to go over here and I'm going to have this picture taken of you there. Okay, that's great. Okay, now get over here, sit down. And we're going to, you know, I'm Richard Hunt and all that stuff. Sit down and, and okay, and then you stop. Do you stop? So I had brought with God. me a suitcase with my own puppets in there. And I would take them out one by one and do these things for Richard. 
and I had a very awful looking Fozzie Bear and uh, did my Fozzie Bear routine and uh, had the Kermit, uh, my awful looking Kermit puppet, which was made of an upholstery type of fabric. And uh, I said, uh, excuse me, Mr. Hunt, um, I'm not sure I like the way you're treating these people here. And he looked at Oh yeah, what are you gonna do about a frog? You know, kind of thing. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, nothing, nothing. You're you're doing fine. Keep going. That thing like that. So, and he said, "Yep, you got to stay till Friday. Jim's gonna love you." Kind of thing. And um, uh, I want you to stay for Friday. You'll come in Friday night. You'll see Jim himself. And all that stuff. So, okay. Uh, I had to stay with our aunt and. Uh, Markham, thank goodness I had an aunt in Markham, so we could stay there. But my mother had to go back home because uh, we, we, I was raised on a farm, and you know you can't really leave that kind of stuff behind for very long, kind of thing. So I, uh, mm -hmm. she left, the, flew back, and and I stayed on till Friday, and uh, Friday night, uh, meeting Jim. I would do the same routine, except I changed the end of my routine. I put Kermit to the very end. And the suitcase was in such a way that it, it, the, the, the cover would be making, making it so that Jim couldn't see in to the suitcase. And the very last I brought Kermit out and said, hi, daddy, kind of thing like that. And <laughs> Jim got a great kick out of it and, and uh, conversed in his Kermit voice to, to Kermit kind of thing. And uh, so then everybody started, oh, oh, do Cookie Monster, do, do Bert, do, do Ernie. You know, <laughs> hey, buddy Bert. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, I do all those impersonations while they, you know, they would be shouting out and everything. And um, uh, then uh, I answered some questions that they had for me. Uh, and um, then Jim pulls out a book. And the book is called uh, Of Muppets and Men. The making of the Muppet Show. Very nice big book. And he opens it up and he starts signing in it in a green marker. He opened up the book and in a green marker he puts to Terry from Jim Henson and Kermit the Frog, the other one. <laughs> and I thought, okay, the moment he brought the book out, I was thinking, oh, this is uh, either a way of thanks for coming, you know, Good luck to your future and all that stuff. Or I've got the job, one or the other. So and I didn't know at that point, you know, so he's, he was signing the thing. And I said, does that mean I've got the job? And he looked up, oh, yeah. So I, okay, I'm in kind of thing. And of course, uh, uh, I had to call my mother and everybody and all her friends and everything. And uh, it, was, it was great. That's how I got in with uh, Fraggle Rock. Nice. So you were talking a little bit about Richard Hunt, uh, who, uh, if he was still with us, uh, would have just turned 70. His birthday would have been this week. Yeah. Um, and event, and uh, do you have any other, like, memories of Richard from when you were working on Fraggle Rock and all that stuff? Any, any, any times that he, like, made you laugh or anything? Well, Richard w was, was very much uh, – uh, 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 oh, boy, he's quite complex. Um, because he's like very New York, uh, that's where he sort of comes from. I think it was Jersey or New Jersey or something like that. But anyway, he he's from the tougher part of of New York, and uh, so he has this very uh, in your face kind of way about him that uh, he he he's a person that uh, is very loud, and boisterous, and, and and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, but he has a heart of gold on mm. you know he's a very wonderful guy um you know it's like what are you gonna do about it you know it's kind of thing like that and, uh, you know and but you know he, he you know he's a very, very good guy uh richard was very very good with his comedic time with you know being able to be funny and, and everything and um uh so he was you know he, he was a lot of of course they all ad libbed on the show you know here and there mm. during performances and they were all very funny uh but richard's very tough in, in new york but, but but like i said very very nice guy he'll he he would give you the shirt off his back you know he, he was that giving and that good of it. Mm. 
good of a man, you know, kind of thing, but with a very rough exterior kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people talk that no one's kind of say that he was like that, like very funny, but at the same time, very generous. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Mm. That's right. And uh, what about, go ahead. His humor was very, like, very, you know, very tough humor kind of thing. But, mm -hmm. uh, but very gentle guy inside. Mm. And what about Jim Henson? What was Jim Henson like? Well, Jim is, is a very, was a very quiet guy. Um, uh, and um, he, he enjoyed being with the performers, the, being in there performing with the performers more than anything else. Uh, he, uh, he was just like one of the guys performing, but, you know, in, when, when we first meet the man and when you're first, you know, like for the first 12 episodes, I mean, you're, you're thinking of him more like a god almost because, you know, this, this is Jim Henson. Oh my gosh, you know, um, so yeah, um, but very, very gentle and, and very kind and nice and, uh, um, very, you know, a good, like, like everybody, very funny. And, um, uh, he was just very good at what he, what he did, you know? Um, I mean, it looks like when, when you watch a performer like Jim, who's performing on there, like when the first time I seen him performing was with the convincing John character in the, uh, uh, listen to convincing John song there where he's trying, it's where they're trying to stop all the fraggles from eating doozer sticks and, and that kind of thing. Mopey's trying to stop them. So she brings in convincing John and convincing John is almost like this evangelistic type of character that can sing this song and, and persuade you to do anything. Uh, but when he's performing that, I mean, if you, you look under the puppet where the person performing it, it looks like pure chaos and pure, it's just crazy and all over the place. But then you look on that monitor and it looks very right and uh, it, it, it makes sense and everything. But, you know, when you see down below. You know, mm. but, but Jim was great. Um, uh, Jim liked to pull, you know, jokes as well and, and uh, um, have this little humor in them that, uh, you know, is, is pretty good. Um, uh, you know, there are times where I wish I got to know the man better, but this is a man who kept moving and, and going and going. And uh, if he wasn't performing, he was in meetings. If he wasn't in meetings, he was on a plane going there to England to deal with Dark Crystal or, or Labyrinth. If he wasn't there, he was flying to New York or some other thing. You know, so this is a man that was just on going, 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 going. You know, it's a, it was a, um, a workaholic to a certain degree, but it's a workaholic that he really enjoyed what he did, kind of thing, mm -hmm. uh, where some workaholics don't, but, uh, but Jim really enjoyed what he was doing. So, yeah. Mm. Uh, going back to the topic of Richard Hunt, um, before you got the role, Richard portrayed the storyteller Fraggle character yes. for one episode. Yeah, that was in the Terrible Tunnel episode, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how did you end up getting that part? Richard, uh, uh, Jerry Jewell, Jerry Jewell came up to me and said, uh, look, um, you mind doing the storyteller for, for this week? Uh, Richard can't make it back because he's busy working on Sesame Street. He can't get out of doing that particular piece and uh would you take it on and i said well yeah sure do you want me to do it exactly like richard do you want me to impersonate richard and just do exactly like he did or he said do whatever you want i said make it yours if you want to do a little bit of richard but make it yours you know yeah, that, that, that's great too sort of thing so i thought okay all right won't be uh uh well, I was, I was intending to have it go crazy as he did because he had the storyteller really, you know, all over the place kind of thing, you know. Come in, come in, come in, come in. I don't want any. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing like that. And um, so I, I took on the role and, and, and um, I sort of brought it a little down a little bit. And um, uh, somehow, I, yeah, yeah, it was in the script that she had a wonderful loving comment about traveling Matt. And so uh, I took, we, we took that and ran with it and she uh, ended up in love with traveling Matt. So, oh, Matt Fraggle, what a Fraggle. <laughs> oh, the stories I could tell, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, uh, so uh, I think it was BP Nickel wrote the, the show that I did of her in there. 
And, uh, you know, I can't remember which, I think I sort of know which episode it was. I think it was uh, Boober Rock, I think was the first time I did her on that episode, I think. Um, and um, I think BP Nickel wrote it. And he wrote any of the storyteller stuff that I did. BP was the one that wrote it sort of thing. So I, th I think he was sort of the creator of uh, the storyteller, I think. Uh, uh, could have been anyway. Yeah. But um, we got along very well, so well that I had uh, asked BP if he would head right for Blizzard Island kind of thing. And that's how he got on that show there that I recommended BP Nickel as a head writer for. It. Nice. Um, you were talking a little bit about um, uh, your performance trying to be a little bit different than Richard. That uh, almost reminds me of uh, something that uh, you and I were talking about at my school, which is uh, Richard performing Elmo. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Um, yeah. Yeah, because he hated doing Elmo. He hated yeah, I had always heard, because if any of you listeners haven't heard uh, Richard doing Elmo, uh, this actually scares the hell out of my friends, but it's not the same Elmo that we all grew up with. It's not like the very high falsetto voice. Richard's characters were always very loud for the most part. Yeah, he's more almost like a caveman type talking kind of. Yeah. Elmo, like, Elmo, want to play, you know, kind of thing yeah. like that or some, something like that. I can't remember now what the voice that Richard did, but it was. Uh, uh, and then one time I remember hearing Elmo uh, uh, doing, hey, you know, that kind of, uh, yeah, hey, you know, that kind of tone, I think. One mm. time, I thought it's just I heard. so creepy now when you think about it. Yeah, Elmo. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think I think Elmo had at, at, before I came. You know, at, from what I could remember, I think two other Richard Hunt and somebody else, and then Kevin Clash. It was Brian Meal uh, that's that originated think. Elmo. Yeah, and then Kevin Clash took it until well, you know, and then um, uh, now uh, Ryan Dillon is doing Elmo. He's doing such a great job. With oh yeah, Elmo. like. You oh, can't yeah. tell. You can't exactly. Tell yeah. Exactly. You know, Ryan. Ryan is a great guy. I I I've, I've uh, talked to Ryan before, and that kind of, he's a great great guy. I, I like him. I like him. I like him. Yeah. yeah. Well, for any of the listeners who don't know the story with Richard doing Elmo, uh, from what I've heard, was um, that Richard throws the Elmo puppet to Kevin Clash, and he's like, "You do this stupid thing." <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Only he did. He had a little more colorful language than that. But he, but yeah, he actually, he threw that right at Kevin Clay. You do this thing, you know, kind of, you know, you exactly, do it, you know, kind of thing. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, he was a little bit more graphic, but yeah, you know, he. That's how much he hated the thing. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like George Carlin doing Elmo then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That would freak me out too. Um, <laughs> so, you were on uh, Fraggle Rock throughout the entire run, right? Yes, for the first uh, for the first series, yeah, yeah. Uh, from from uh, yeah, from day one right to the very end. Yeah. Hmm. During uh, that period of time, do you have a favorite character that you did from Fraggle Rock? Um, that I did myself. Yeah, or or just oh. maybe held up, like wasn't talking, but was just a lot of fun to do in a scene. Well, uh, we we were sort of, um, uh, I, w I was doing background puppetry for the most part on that show and um, and was lucky enough to get the storyteller. But, uh, and then I also did Brio, uh, one of the minstrels in the minstrel episode. Uh, it was a, actually a girl character, again, another female character. And she played the wow. symbols. Yeah, she played symbols. She was green. She was the only fraggle in the group. Of course, they seemed to think that uh, Cantus was a Fraggle as well, but for a Fraggle, he looks quite different than other Fraggles. But Brio was 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 a Fraggle, quote unquote, you know, kind of thing. Only green and and had the silver uh, shirt on with a pack on her back, kind of thing. And she played the symbols, and uh, I played her. And she got to speak, I think, two times in the whole series, a um, couple of times in the whole series, and. Uh, um, I got to do her a little more in the last one I did of her, which was the, oh my gosh, the Honk of Honks episode uh, was where I got to do the most dialogue with her. And for her, uh, I couldn't do like a storyteller. So I had to, oh, don't worry, Nobo. There are lots of things you can do, you know, kind of thing like that. So that's how I did her. Uh, now, back to the background again, 
uh, we eventually, around, uh, around the 13th or 12th episode, we were told to sort of try to establish our own background characters, our own background fraggles, you know, try to make them our own kind of thing. And it was uh, like Jane Henson was sort of spearheading that. And so we had this, you know, meeting up, up the upstairs with, with her and, and the, you know, uh, the, a lot of the background perform, uh, Canadian performers were there. And uh, we were told that we could create our own characters. And so I came up with uh, a character called, that I called Morris Fraggle. And he was a Fraggle that was um, yellow and um, had this sort of short, Hair that was sort of very short, and I, I decided I would make him into a sort of a fraggle reporter, kind of thing. So when there was an episode called, I think we love you Wembley, and in that episode I was playing a saxophone fraggle that came in during one of Wembley's songs and did this saxophone saxophone piece. The puppet I had on for that uh, would become more Fraggle. And it was so comfortable if that puppet fit like a glove and I could manipulate it very well and everything. And I love the look of this character. Uh, he had a, all, all at that point, he had a little t-shirt on kind of thing with the ribbing and all that kind of thing. And um, we were told the to go up and have the meeting with Jane. So I grabbed a set of glasses off of another Fraggle and put them on him. And so he ended up with glasses. Coincidentally, all three of my characters wore glasses. Storyteller had glasses. Brio had glasses. And Morris had glasses. And so that's where Morris started getting creative. Kind of thing. I didn't get Morris's outfit established uh, until the two shows later because the very next show we did was called I Don't Care. And in that one, everybody is dressed up like Vikings. Okay? They're putting on this play that Red and Moki want to do and sort of thing. So uh, Moore still had his glasses, but he had Viking outfit kind of on. And I used them for that episode kind of thing. So he's at, he's actually right behind uh, uh, Boober and Wembley during that whole courtroom piece and um, during the song as well. And in the song, I don't know if the director really knew, but I didn't say anything because I, I was willing to have do it. You know, I wanted to be in there, but he gets in two shots of the same scene. So he's there in back of Wembley and Boober and there's a stack of books where these two fraggles are. One of them is Morris, and I played him in that, and another fraggle there. And we did the wah, 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 wah in the song and that kind of thing. And um, boop, boop, be doo. I think that was mine. Boop, boop, be doo was mine. Um, but I, I did that to the track kind of thing with Morris. And then after that, I created the ensemble of what Morris would wear and everything. Uh, I used an old uh, jacket of Gobos. Um, it was a prototype jacket that they had for him in blue. And I used that for, I think, two episodes. And then they decided that they would have to change the jacket. And I asked, well, why are you changing the jacket to another color? And they said, well, if, you, if we took him into blue screen, he's going to disappear. Kind of thing. So that's why, why the jacket ended up changing to sort of a brownish, not really a brown, but a purple brown kind of color was, was what the jacket ended up ultimately being. And uh, there Morris is created. And I, I originally I had a little, uh, a little, some paper in his pocket with a pencil because he was supposed to be a reporter, but that got dropped because the whole thing about uh, coming up with background characters was sort of uh, kind of faded away, but everybody, there was few of us that kept our characters that we created, myself and uh, um, there's a few of the other guys that kept their characters like Gord Robertson kept Rumple for himself kind of thing. So he used Rumple throughout the series. Kind of thing. And that's how the, uh, that's the characters that I, he, Mor Morris was the, the character I loved the best. Although he got very few, he only got two lines in the whole series, but uh, uh, he was my favorite of all the fraggles that I 
you know, head on. Uh, if you're talking about the main Fraggle Five, or or you know, or the other ones, I liked uh, Red a lot. Of course, I was very good friends with Karen Prell, and so that sort of probably I was biased because of that sort of thing. So um, and um, uh, let's see, um, I liked the two rats that the trash heap had, uh, Philo and, and Guns. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's was, Philo. Uh, I always thought it was Philo. Yeah, that Philo. What did you thought it was? I thought it was Philo. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, great. But, oh my God, Philo was done by Dave Goals, and that was the pink one. And Richard Hunt did Gunge, which was the gray one. Mm. The uh, trash heap and... has spoken. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I guess, according to uh, Dave Goals. Uh, uh, Richard took the lead in that and ended up making them like the Bronx type of characters, you know, tough Bronx kind of kind of little guys. Yeah. And Dave just followed suit with him. So they both ended up sort of the same. You are in the prison shop. The old we all knowing trash, trash heap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on a little bit from Fraggle Rock, um, yes. you were in one of my very favorite film adaptations of any Muppet production, which of course is Follow That Bird, one of the very few Sesame Street feature films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was actually born not too long before Elmo and Grouchland came out. I've never seen Sesame Street on the big screen yet. I do know that they are working on a brand new Sesame Street feature film, so hopefully I'll get it. Wow. Yeah, I was talking to Marty Robinson about it, and I was saying to him, yeah, I'm so excited to finally, after 22 years, fi or however long it takes, I'm currently 22, but to finally be able to see Sesame Street on the big screen. I can't even remember what year Elmo and Grudgeland came out. That was in 1999. 1999? Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would be probably about right. Yeah, where we did it in the 80s, kind of did the follow that bird. Kind of mm. Yeah. What was it like to work on that film? It was very slow. Oh, slower than television because you're working with film and that's a little that has to be lit properly. So it's a lot of time to light everything up and, and make sure it's, it's proper and everything. And, and you're shooting with one camera at a time, whereas in television, you can use three cameras at the same time. Uh, but for the follow that bird movie you had to use one camera so that you'd have to take longer because you're shooting all the close-ups and then the wide shots and then another close-up or you know that kind of thing so you're doing one thing at a time kind of thing. um i had cookie monster for the hooper store scene um inside the hooper store scene and um, was it the one where they were uh, uh putting to get was it the one where they were putting up uh, the plan to find big bird that's the one. That's the one. Cool. I'm Cookie Monster in that one, in that little okay. scene. And um, uh, I had uh, the I had my back against the shelving unit that's holding, you know, all the prop food props and stuff. Uh, there'd be candy up there. Yeah. And yes, yes. Well, between takes, when I had Cookie Monster down, I took his took my hand out of his hand, and I would reach up. And there was a jar of Smarties there. And I grabbed a few and ate them. A little later over the PA, they said, whoever's eating the Smarties, don't eat the, don't, don't eat the set. Don't, don't eat the props. <laughs> don't eat the props. That was either aimed at you or Cookie Monster. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> 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 And uh, so, yeah, it was a, that, that's the funny moment I can remember from that. And I do remember doing a honker in the scene at the end where they're showing, uh, they're going around showing Miss Finch all the friends that Big Bird has. You know, it's just like going around in a circle to each character. So the camera's in the middle and we're all around, circled around the camera and it's going to one, you know, slowly going panning from one character to another. So I'm doing one of the honkers type of uh, thing there. They don't talk, but they just honk kind of thing. So I can't remember if it was green or what. I can't remember the color now, what, what color he was, but anyway. 
I do know. That, I do know from Tim Gosley that he was doing the Green Honker that served as uh, Oscar's car horn. Oh, that's out in the yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. So I think w- when we did that, I think all the street scenes were done first. Then oh, they okay. went out on location. And you uh, weren't going on location. I couldn't because I had to get back uh, to to Nova Scotia for whatever the reason. I can't remember now what what the full reason was. I think I think I had the uh, I had the flight. I didn't even know they were staying longer, kind of thing. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was uh, that kind of thing. So, my bad. But um, uh, I got to do, you know, all the street scenes. Uh, in the opening, where Big Bird is skating in mm-hmm. the opening of that, I'm doing Biff in uh, down in a manhole playing checkers with a real guy who's a fireman there. Ah. Uh. But it's very, very small in the in you know movie screen is big, and your television monitor is small, so I couldn't even see where I'm at in that. So I just had to, you know. Mm. Uh, Did you actually try to take on Biff's voice for that? No, he didn't say anything, and uh, I can't remember if I did or not. Um, I would have probably been like, okay, it's your move now. Yeah, I don't know. No, I couldn't. I couldn't even do Biff if I wanted to. <laughs> I can do some of Jerry's characters. But well, he is he is Biff right here. You know, this is. <laughs> I I also do a really good Sully as well. <laughs> Considering Sully doesn't say anything. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like every. I feel like Sully is the only Muppet that everyone can do an impression of. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> he goes to talk. But something and stops Biff him. Shuts him up. Yeah. Yeah. Biff pretty much shuts him up. Mm. <laughs> so when you did uh, follow that bird, uh, did you get to work with any of the celebrities that were in it? Uh, no, because they they were all on the location shots. Most of them. I okay. Think. I don't think any of them were, were were in the street scenes. Ooh, I'm okay. wrong. I'm really wrong. But anyway. Mm. Yeah, I I just was wondering if perhaps maybe the Sandra Bernhardt scene was done on a soundstage or if it was in an actual restaurant. I think that uh, mm, it could be a soundstage, but at a different place in the in the studio. Okay. Uh, because the the, the sta- soundstage we were using for that couple of two or three days there was just strictly the Sesame Street uh, street scene, mm-hmm. kind of the outside stuff, you know, and inside as well. Um. But hers are probably was a different in a different uh, location, mm. yeah. whether, whether it be in a, inside a studio or, or you know whatever. Mm. And speaking of Sesame Street, uh, what was it like to have Kevin Clash doing Elmo in the Canadian Sesame Street special Basil Hears a Noise? Oh my, that one! Yeah, he's pretty good. He's very very down to business type of guy. Um, I didn't get to know him very well. Uh, but he was getting irritated with uh, with Ralph Mills and Gord Robertson because they were joking around a lot. Gord and Rob, they they, they were quite the jokesters in in Fraggle Rock. And, and sounds like Rob. They, yeah, they they carried that on, and they were like, you know, fooling around. And Alma would turn around and say, "Shut up!" Oh my god. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm just trying to hear Elmo saying that. That would be so weird. <laughs> yeah, so you see telling them, shut up. <laughs> it's like what I was saying about the possibility of George Carlin doing Elmo. That would be weird too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think they I either either he was joking or they got on his nerves, one or the other. <laughs> or maybe a little bit of both. A little bit of both could be, yeah. 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 That is too Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> so um you were also as i mentioned in the intro you were also in muppet family christmas which is hands down that's my favorite that's yeah. my favorite of all the specials we've done that that was my absolute favorite i can see why like it's and, and it's too bad they don't get the chance to do much of this anymore but it's mixing all of jim henson's amazing creations together for this big yeah you know yeah yeah it's like yeah. new kids and on it the felt, it was done sort of like in the summer but it felt christmas mm. kind of thing yeah, and, and, and it was just, it was just, God, it, it is the best. Oh yeah, the best of the best, in my opinion. 
kind of thing. Uh, we had some wonderful songs. I love the sing song at the end, the fireplace sing song. In that shot, I'm doing a brown grouch next to Big Bird. Uh, in the flip side, I'm doing Floyd Pepper behind the couch, kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so yeah, and different characters in different places. I think I did Zoot during the uh, the Muppet Baby singing. Uh, you better watch out. I believe. Okay. Uh, and uh, where else was I? I was New Zealand. Yeah, I was in the back. I, I was in the back of the truck. I did New Zealand for the back of the truck uh, in the opening. And uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. And uh, there was a close up of them too in that too. And I was running right, that yeah. close up. Um, yeah. Lou Zion, I take the throw the fish away and they come back to me. <laughs> Do it, Kevin. <laughs> I, I, so that's, I, uh, I wonder if they, uh, if they had some ahead. of that boomer. I wonder if they had some of that boomerang fish for Christmas dinner. <laughs> You can't pan fry him. I won't <laughs> let you. <laughs> so where where did you shoot Muppet Family Christmas? Was that on a soundstage or was the house scenes like at some uh, studio? Yeah, um, that was on a soundstage. That was in Toronto as well. And I can't remember. God, it was that Glenn Warren Productions that we did that at or was it the other one? Uh, um, I'm not yeah. sure. Well, it's not the I Fraggle Studio, I'll tell you that. That's a small one. That's a smaller facility. Uh, so the for, for the specials they went to places like uh, like the uh, uh, Glenn Warren Productions. Uh, that was a nice. That's a big studio where they have. Uh, that's where Hanging In was uh, shot, um, and um, John Biner show was shot there, I believe. Okay. So yeah, Hanging In actually. Sorry, I did that wrong. Hanging In was shot at our Fraggle Studios, which is BTR Productions. Uh, cool. Yeah. Hmm. And so is King of Kensington. That was shot in, uh, in our in the Fraggle studio as well, but yeah, I think it was Glenn Warren or the other studio. Um, but it was a lot of fun. It was a great, 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 great show. So uh, let's move on from the Muppets and talk a little bit about some of your original creations, starting with uh, Blizzard Island. How did that all come about? Well, Blizzard Island, uh, my my friend Stony Ripley and I created it when we were in high school uh and grade 12 again wow last year of uh, high school there we came up with the characters for blizzard island and uh wrote our own script and everything and uh uh sort of wrote it while i was working on fraggle rock and um uh, i was able to get enough money together to get a uh vhs uh player and a uh, camera and all that stuff and we filmed our own little home video of Blizzard Island. When we, we tried to, we made sets and all that stuff. I made the puppets and we made the sets and, and everything. And it, yes, it, it it looked cheap, but it was not too bad for a couple of kids, you know, that that uh, you know that are trying to do this sort of out of pocket, you know, little things here and there. I would buy a uh, one of those uh, uh, oh, one of those. Um, thing that you could put up on the wall it looked like a castle for bricks kind of thing okay. so yeah um so we did that and uh while um while we were while i was working on fraggle rock i would try to sell this idea to uh, different places as much as i could and uh, ultimately uh andrew cochran of andrew cochran productions uh, uh bought sort of got into the ID and got CBC involved and uh, uh, went from there and uh, retooled it again. Uh, when Stoney and I did it for uh, for our home video, we wrote it and did it very much like a Muppet production, basically. It was like a lot of, uh, a lot of jokes and gags and a lot of talking, breaking the fourth wall and talking to the audience here and there. Uh, so yeah, we did, we did a lot of that stuff. But when we got into the actual series, uh, it was very changed around quite a bit. And we ended up having uh, real kids. Uh, and originally I had puppet kids as Tracy and Wayne in that show. And uh, ultimately they wanted real human kids. And I thought about it for a bit and I thought, yeah, you know, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, you could, um, 
you know, the kids at home could identify with the characters on Blizzard Island. You know, you, you too can be Rog's friend and try to return the necklace to Argon and and uh, meet this witch and, and snake and all that stuff. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, so you also created your own uh, puppet character, Butch Cat. Did you build that puppet as well? Yes, I did. Um, Butch the Cat was actually created for the IWK Telethon, in which CBC ran. Uh, it was originally done by CBC, and, and they came to me hoping to have the Blizzard Island characters be in the telethon. And we had them in the telethon for the first two years. So Rog was there. Uh, and we only used the other characters from Blizzard Island as a promotional thing. But they mostly had Rog there. And when Blizzard Island got canceled, um, uh, Andrew Cochran thought that maybe it'd be a good idea to just let the characters go. And I said, yeah, I agree. I agree. Just let it go. And then Terry Filmer uh, called me and asked if I could be a part of the thing. And uh, I said, yeah, sure, come over and we'll talk about it. And uh, we talked about it. And we talked about uh, a character that would have to be able to take on Frank Cameron, I guess. Uh, you know, he's, a, he's a celebrity of the CBC at that time. He did the, uh, he did the 530 and the, uh, uh, I forgot now what the name of the, uh, of the nighttime news that he did there, uh, but he did uh, that and he was fairly well known for it. So uh, it had to be somebody who could take on Frank Cameron. And I said, well, it sounds like to me, he's gotta be a bit of a stinker character kind of thing. So I had these puppets on a rack beside us and I looked at this sort of slightly uh, greenish kind of cat puppet that I had. And uh, I took him off the peg and put him on and said, uh, well, how about this? And, and he could be a real tough character. So he's going to be a tough character. So he's got to talk. Uh, we'll call him Butch. You know, he's Butch, you know, kind of thing. Uh, so um, that's where Butch was created. And I used that puppet for the first two or three years of, um, of, the, of the IWK that I'd had him on. And uh, the puppet got abused badly. I only had the one puppet at the time. And we had him eat ice cream. And we had Frank Cameron push his head into a cream pie. Uh, with each one of these stunts that you do, it has an effect on the puppet because you've got to go in and rinse it off in the bathroom. And uh, uh, one day I, I was rinsing off the puppet there because he was, I think it was the cream pie one. And um, uh, I forgot not to use hot water because uh, a lot of the Muppets are made sort of like a contact cement type of glue mm -hmm. and contact cement lets go in heat. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have direct heat to apply to it. Uh, contact cement lets go. So his, the lip, the top upper part of the lip started coming off and I, <gasps> you know, I had to stop and, and, uh, uh, you know, try to dry him off and all that stuff. And, and here for the rest of it, his lip, uh, upper lip was hanging down just a bit there and I was having trouble getting into him because not only was he wet but he was in the inside is shrinking because he's wet so I couldn't get into him fast enough either either he was shrinking or I was getting bigger one or the other and uh, I decided well I'm gonna have to rebuild the puppet because uh, you know I can't I, it's very hard to get into him now you know to get put that puppet on so I redesigned them and re I couldn't find the same fur anymore. So I had to make them out of a whole nother kind of fur. And what I found was a sort of a bluish kind of greenish blue uh, fur uh, and uh, built him out of that. And uh, then I had to, actually it was, I think it was white fur that I dyed personally, I dyed the thing and it ended up being what it is. And then when I had to do another one later, I had to re-dye the same stuff and it came out just a bit different. But anyway, it was, uh, yeah, so that, that uh, butch was uh, done. And I made them with moving eyelids. I made that one with moving lids. My favorite online video of Butch is definitely the, uh, and, and you made a cameo in it, Aunt Kitty's Cookies. I think he was doing oh. like, a, like an ad or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's trying to do an ad and I'm the director mm -hmm. kind of thing. 
and I, I, I let my beard grow a bit there to make, it, to make me look rough and, and you know, uh, not a very nice guy kind of thing. So I had to be, I had to be a mean character. You know? <laughs> and I have them breaking down at the end. Kind of thing. So <laughs> that's my first and only acting gig that I did, that I've done. <laughs> besides puppeteering. Yeah, besides puppeteering, yeah. Mm. yeah that's, that's the only time I make a personal appearance. Have you ever thought about did you or did you ever think about doing a TV series featuring Butch? Because I think that would be funny. Uh, we um, trying to sell a TV series in Canada is really, 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 really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Butch is the humor that is done with Butch is, is somewhat like Muppet humor, where it's a little more for the adults and stuff. And um, uh, Canadian television wants to pigeonhole. Uh, puppets as being for little kids, uh, like uh, six-year-olds and stuff like that. They couldn't see having a, a character, you know, uh, and things. We, we created even, even a rock band one time uh, called Tooth and Claw, and uh, that didn't sell. That didn't go over uh, because, again, it was, you know, like too, uh, too advanced humor kind of thing. So, so that sadly, that's that's the way it was. And I said, well, uh, why can't you have a? Uh, they said they wanted to. It has to be a kids show. We can't have puppets in a family thing. And I said, well, how come Jim Henson can make a, a show for family, but I can't? Kind of thing. I said, well, your name's not Jim Henson. Ouch. Yeah. So that's that's where I learned. Okay, that that's it then. You know, you know, unless your name is Jim Henson, forget it. You know. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, yeah. It didn't stop us from trying, but you know, we you know, we we now understand where the mind of the CBC is. You know. mm. So yeah. Now to wrap it up, one of uh the one of my regular listeners uh, has a question for you. Uh sure. Anthony Thompson is asking, are you looking forward to the new Fraggle Rock series? I'm looking forward to seeing it. I can't do it mm. because my back is, is so bad now. I, I have yeah. my, my, uh, my back and my right hip uh, hurt a lot now. And I can't even build right now. I can't oh. sit in my rolling chair in the workshop and build the puppets now even. I mean, it stopped me around 19 sort of 1999, I believe, is when, when I did my biggest uh, performance, although I did perform a little bit after that, too. But that was the end of the big performing of it. Um, uh, because my, my back just gave right out. I was in sheer pain uh, and still am here and there. Uh, my hip wants to grab very violently sometimes if I move the wrong way or if I do something too, too uh, intense with it. Mm. So that's why I'm not going to be able to do the new Fraggle Rock, which hurts me a great deal, because they did ask me to come back for that. And oh, that's I good. Say, yeah, they, they sent me an email and everything. Uh, do you want to come up and play? Sign the, uh, uh, just sign the, uh, uh, the disclosure, meaning you can't open your mouth about it, you know, to others until right. the thing is on the air. Kind of thing. Uh, so, um but I had to turn it down and, and it really hurt me deeply to do that. Mm. Well, yeah, I, I totally understand though. Mm. Well, I got to speak to Karen and Pearl again. <laughs> she called me through the internet there. Oh, we wow. chatted for a while and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Well, hi, Karen, if you're listening. <laughs> I don't know if you are, but if you are, hi from Terry and I. <laughs> yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, Terry, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say to finish? I just follow your dream as best as you can, you know, um, you know, just uh, don't give up. Yeah. Have something to fall back on too, but, you know, try to try to strive for what you can, you know, and, um, um, keep trying, um, and have fun. The most, the biggest thing is have fun with it. You know, mm -hmm. it's a lot of fun if you, you know, if you do this right. Mm -hmm. Well, Terry, thank you so much for coming to Nostalgia Talk tonight. Very welcome. 
And to the listeners, I will see you next time. Peace. I'll see you next time on The Muppet Show. <laughs> see you next time on Nostalgia Talk. Yeah. <laughs>